Okay, I'm going to talk about PolyMom's design rules. Okay, we talked about the process last time. Now we need to, to apply those process variations to our design process, right? So that um, we incorporate the design rules as we're designing. Okay? So as a designer, you've got to understand what it is that the... Um, that the um, design is doing for you and how it interacts with the process. All right, so the purpose of the design rules is to ensure the greatest possibility of success when you're making it. The fabrication equipment and process has different tolerances, the, the different equipment. Okay, so you might be overlaying two layers with each other and the equipment you're using has a little bit of a slop to it. Every piece of equipment does. Okay, so that's why we build in these tolerances. In photolithography, we transfer the mask image to the photoresist on the wafer. Okay, so that's what we do. We have a mask, which is our design that we created on the computer, and we created a mask. We put it on the mask and then we use that mask to image the wafer. And we can do it as a one-to-one -one like we do in our clean room, or we can use a stepper and do a reduction. So we start out with a bigger um, mask and then we ma uh, demagnify it. We shrink it down to be on the wafer. So here's a question for you guys. What do you think the two critical measurements are Ensure proper transfer and lithography. What are the two things you want to do? Exposure time. Exposure time? What does that drive? It, uh, You're on the right track. Well, that, that uh, hardens the water resist, right? So if the exposure isn't long enough and it won't behave right when you go to develop it. Okay, so if you don't expose long enough, if this is your photoresist, okay, here's your mask. Your mask has a bit of chrome on it, right? So the light goes through there. Okay, then the light comes through, except for where there's chrome. It exposes the photoresist all around here, right? And if and then we develop it. And ideally, Okay, you would get a nice straight profile, right, a photoresist. If I expose too long, maybe it gets a little bit smaller, right? Because we're exposing more of the photoresist, we might get something that looks like this. So it gets smaller. So if we overexpose, it gets smaller. If we underexpose, it might be too big or start to have some residual photoresist scumming. So the exposure time dictates how wide your structure is to some extent, right? It's a combination of what you drew on the mask and what the final critical dimension is. So one of the two critical measurements is the critical dimension, the line width, the space, how, how much photoresist is left, how wide it is. Okay, in my... Um, so one of the critical measurements is the is the line width itself. What's the other one? What's what? It's the spacing between the lines. Okay, the spacing between the lines. That's also a critical dimension. So you're going to create spaces and lines. So if the lines are too narrow or get narrower, the spaces are going to get wider. So they're related to each other. There's still one other thing we do in photolithography. We make lines, we make spaces. That's one thing we do. What's the other thing? Oh, alignment. alignment or overlay. How one layer overlaps the other layer. Okay? So photolithography pattern transfer, we, we want to transfer the image accurately and precisely. So we want to get the same critical dimensions, the same line widths, 
and um, spaces that we drew on our design, right? So the critical dimension of the mask and design is important. Okay, are we getting the line width we want? Are we getting the correct space or space width? The other thing that's important is if you have more than one mask layer, it's how one mask layer aligns to the other mask layer. Okay? So that's part of the pattern transfer. The first pattern needs to be aligned correctly relative to the wafer. Close, right? The second layer needs to be aligned to the first layer. The third layer needs to be aligned to the first and second layer. So you'll see in the design rules, the, the tolerances for overlay and alignment are tighter for the lower la layers, the, the first few layers you print. But as you print more and more layers, there's less and less tolerance allowed. So you have to have a bigger, bigger tolerance to ensure that the, the design you're making will work. Does that make sense? So hopefully it'll make more sense when we get into the pictures of how these things um, work in the design rule documentation. So we have to we have to adhere to the line width and alignment design rules. So today, we'll, after we go through this lecture, we'll do a, a simple cantilever and we'll adhere to those design rules. Okay. In photolithography, there are minimum space and line width rules. The exposure tool is limited to how small it can image. So we can't make lines smaller than a certain size. So the, the machine we have in our clean room, probably we can do a, a, a micron. If we're real careful, maybe a little bit less. But typically, it's one to two microns. is about as small as we want to go. Okay. Now, some of the modern fabrication tools for MEMS, they might do half a micron tolerances. Okay? Uh, Sandia Summit 5 process, they don't want you printing anything smaller than a micron. So no spaces less than a micron, no lines less than a micron. And that's usually pretty good for, um, for MEMS. Because if you go too, too small, then they won't work as sensors and actuators because there's not enough mass, there's not enough area for them to work. Okay, if you have two lines next to each other, there's a limit to how close they can get before they merge, right? Okay, so this is analogous to when you're looking at stars in a, micro, or in a telescope. You can have two stars very close to each other and they can look like one star if you don't have a good telescope. And if you have a better telescope, you can see that, oh no, they're two stars, right? So that's the minimum resolution that you can uh, make out looking at stars. It's the same thing is true when you're trying to image something as well. So if you if you design your two lines too close together, they'll merge. Okay. So they'll bridge. They'll create a short. Those are some terms used. So here's a picture of the uh, mask. Okay, and that's usually quartz. It's clear to the blue light and green light we use when we're um, exposing the photoresist. And here you see a line and a space. So a line-space pair is called a pitch. And that's really cool because if you print something from a mask onto a wafer and has a given pitch, the pitch won't change with respect to focus which is really nice. It's nice to do that. So you can measure the pitch, and you know what that's supposed to be. So if the pitch is 10 microns, and you have a line space pair of, you know, maybe line of 8 microns and a space of 2, you add line and space together, you get pitch. So you know that the distance from one edge of the photoresist to the same edge of the next line is going to be 10 microns. Now, if this thing goes out of focus, if you have a process issue, that line can get smaller, the space will get bigger, but the pitch stays the same. So that's very useful for you because then you can use that as a way of cross-calibrating your, your critical dimensions and 
and your measurement tools. Okay? So I wanted to bring that out. Now you see this, this pattern here of lines and spaces. Have a good weekend. You have a lines and spaces here. If you have another layer and you need to overlay some more lines and spaces or you want to connect some lines to the previous lines, then you're going to have to make sure those two masks um, align to each other and, and overlay properly. And that's what this is showing here. So I pulled this out of a, uh, somebody else's PowerPoint I found online. Okay. And this is from, um, I believe, Rochester Institute of Technology. So they have a, they have a microelectronics program. So they, they have a clean room as well. And you have things called berniers. We call them berniers. They're overlay marks. And you can see the pitch is different for these two overlay marks. So the bottom ones that are grayed out are your first layer ones. So we've already printed those. Now we're on our second layer, and we're going to print on top of that. And we have another set of overlay marks. Okay, And they're slightly different pitch. And you can imagine if the, if the second layer is misaligned relative to the first, that set will move back and forth, and different lines will line up with the first layer. And if you do this right, if you design it right, you'll know how far off you are. And we used um, structures similar to this at TI and at Phillips Semiconductors to inspect each layer to make sure it was lined up to the previous layer, the layer we wanted it to line up, by looking at these marks. Okay, so if one set of marks is, is way off, you'll see maybe the, the leftmost hashed uh, vernier mark overlapping with one of these, and you can count how far off you are, and then you know, oh, I'm 0.3 microns off in alignment and you strip the resist off and then you put an adjustment in your machine by 0.3 microns so then you get it aligned properly. Okay, So you can tell if you're in specification or not. And sometimes you'll get different misalignments across the wafer. If your wafer is rotated or your mask, then you'll see some of the, the parts of the wafer nicely aligned and other parts are misaligned, right? Because it's the angle of rotation may be about a point that's not the center of the wafer. Is the goal to have exact alignment? The goal is to be within a certain tolerance of alignment. You'll never get it exact. It's never going to be perfect. It'll get close, you know, and if you spend a lot of time, you can get it very close. But you also have to think, well, what do I need? Does it make a difference? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends what you're designing. But you're going to have a, a variation, and that variation d determines what the um, design rules are. And then they usually add a little bit extra tolerance to it, right? They sandbag it, as they say. So we have mandatory rules to ensure that all the layouts will remain compatible with the MEMS, CAPS, photolithography processes and tolerances. So those are the poly mumps, the metal mumps, and, and SOI mumps processes. If you violate any of the rules, you could end up with missing structures, or too small structures, or too big structures, or structures that are stuck together, or shorted out. Okay, so you don't want to violate the rules. You have a minimum overlap. Okay, so this goes with alignment, or what they call overlay. So you have enclosure rules. So let's say you're making a anchor, a hole, like we were talking about with our cantilever. That hole has got to be within a certain tolerance, a certain envelope, for the poly zero pad that you're anchoring to. Okay? And it's I think it's four microns. So you, you want to make your poly one at least four microns per side bigger than your anchor one cut, your anchor one hole. 
Okay, and there are other examples of overlap rules that we'll, we'll talk about. The minimum geometry is, is the point you can't get smaller than repeatedly. Okay, so you don't want to push the envelope if you don't have to. So if you're making a cantilever structure or a hinge or a slider and your minimum overlap is a certain amount or your minimum width is 5 or 10 microns, something like that, you don't want to design at 5 or 10 microns all the time. Even though that's the minimum geometry, it may not end up working Okay, on occasion. So stay away from the edge of the cliff. Okay, you can ride your bike at the end of the cliff really well, but if you know a sudden breeze comes up, it'll push you over the cliff. Same thing happens in processing. So the minimum geometry allowed should not be confused with the nominal geometry a designer uses. Minimum geometry should only be used where absolutely necessary. Okay, typically you want to go bigger. So here's here's some of the tolerances that we talked about at the different layers. So the nitride layer is about 0.6 microns thick, but we really don't pattern that layer. The nitride's used to be an electrical isolation layer between the poly zero and the crystalline silicon substrate. Okay, and it's also to protect the silicon from being pitted when you do some of the etching. Poly zero is about a half a micron thick. That's the first layer of polycrystalline silicon. It's doped. It has um, it has uh, electrical conductivity. We use that for traces, right? If we want to bring power from one place to another, and poly zero is also used as a ground plane. So we put it underneath moving structures so they don't stick to the nitride if there's um, electrostatic buildup on the wafer. Because nitride is an insulator. Silicon nitride is an insulator. It does not conduct electricity. Okay, so charges can build up on it. So if we have poly zero on top of the silicon nitride, then we can ground out all of those stray charges and you won't get the poly one stuck to the poly zero because of an electrostatic um, attraction because of the buildup on it. On static on the on the wafer itself. Now CD stands for critical dimensions. Okay, so they say poly zero, you know, you don't really want to go much less than two microns on that. So that's a minimum um, design rule. You don't want to really draw anything less than two microns. Okay, and then they give it a name, poly zero. So that when they're working in the fab, they, you know, if the product is at a certain layer, they call it poly zero. Okay. Then first oxide, the thickness of that oxide layer is two microns. And again, you don't want to have spaces that are too small. Okay. So in first oxide, we do two things. We make an anchor cut, which goes all the way through the oxide, so you can connect. Um, say poly 1, 2, poly 0, right? Poly 1, 2, poly 0, we make a hole in the oxide. That's called anchor, anchor 1. You don't want those holes to be small either. You know, I say 1.7 to 2.3 microns. So don't, don't make them 2 microns if you don't have to. You can make them 3 microns or 4 micron holes, anchor cuts. Now there's this dimple that you're going to use when you make your uh, cantilever today. The dimple is, des is designed to be a small bump on the bottom of the poly 1 so that the poly 1 won't stick to the poly 0. Okay? It's like a little needle at the end of a, a phonograph arm. Okay? Dimples, you don't want to make them too big. You know, if they're 10 by 10 microns, it might be big enough that it'll stick. So you want to keep it small enough that there's not enough surface area for the two polys to stick to each other. But you have to make it big enough so you can process it and make that dimple. So those you want to stick to maybe 
two to three microns all the time. Okay, and you can make multiple dimples. You can make a dimple ring, which we can talk about later if you have a rotary part. Um, second oxide is the oxide between poly one and poly two. It's thinner than first oxide, and you'll see that in some of the cross-section views that we're gonna look at in the design manual. It's 0.75 microns thick. And then we have two holes, two type of holes we put in second oxide. Okay, one is a poly 1 to poly 2 via. Poly 1 to poly 2 via. Actually, it's a hole that you make to connect the poly 2 to the poly 1, because you usually put poly 1 down before poly 2. So if I want to connect a poly 2 structure to a poly 1 structure, I got to make a hole in the second oxide to connect those two. Okay, and that's called poly 1, poly 2 via. And again, you don't want to make those holes smaller than about two microns or so. So stick to two and a half microns or bigger. Usually there's no need to make them too small. Okay, you want to keep them pretty big. And then we have an anchor two cup, or an anchor two. And the anchor two will make a hole um, in, in the second oxide, but it'll also make a hole in the first oxide. So you can draw, draw an anchor two and it'll, on top of oxide one and two, and it'll, it'll make a hole all the way through both of them, that step in the process. Okay, if you have an anchor cut and you have a poly one in between, it'll just go through the second oxide and not the first, because the poly um, one layer will protect the, the uh, first oxide layer. And this will make more sense when we look at some side side views and cross-sectional views. Poly 2 is one and a half microns thick. Now these are lines. Whatever you draw in poly, it's going to be a line or space, right? Or a hole in the poly. Um, whatever you draw in an oxide is going to be a hole for sure, right? So polys, you're making structures and spaces and, and oxides, you're making holes. Okay, metal is a half a micron, and you can decorate the poly 2 with metal. So you could make a grating, maybe, on a moving hinge type thing that could be some kind of um, component for a monochromator. Okay? So this, this will be your friend when you're, when you're drawing. You know, you've got to make sure you're not going to make smaller structures than what's listed here. And it's a nice reference to the labeling of the different layers. So MEMS cap, they, they put this in their manual, is not responsible for process consequences that might result from violating the mandatory or advisory rules. They do have advisories too. Suggestions, don't, don't try this, it probably won't work, <laughs> okay? So this goes back to how you're gonna design and what the masks look like. So what do you see in the field type column? What, what you see two, two options, right? Light and dark, right? So what do you think the light means? What do you think the dark means? What kind of mask you use? It's the same mask, but when does a mask look dark? You hold it up to the light. When it's mostly chrome or mostly glass? Mostly chrome is dark. Yeah, it's mostly chrome. So look where, where it says it's dark. Anchor. Anchor, you make a few holes, right? You're connecting one layer to another. Dimple, you're making some dimples here and there. All right? So when you look at the mask, it's going to be mostly chrome with a little few little holes in it. Or maybe a lot of little holes, but it's still mostly dark. Poly, though, is going to be light. Those are structures. So whatever you draw in poly, in the poly layers, will be a structure. And most of the stuff around it will be clear. So that's why those look like light. So you got dark field and light field masks. And you have to define that when you create a mask. Because if I draw something, 
if I'm drawing in a, in a dark field, everything I draw is going to be a hole. If I'm drawing in a light field, everything I draw is going to be a structure, it's going to be dark. So it's like the negative. Right? So when you send your design to your mask maker, you've got to tell them if it's dark field or light field. Because they, all they see are the structures you drew. They don't know if, hey, did you draw a hole or did you draw a piece of poly? Right? They're opposite of each other. So I made that mistake when I ordered one of the, the pressure sensor masks. And I think I showed you guys. Right? The, we were using a liftoff process. And I used the wrong flavor. I used the light field. And in that case, I wanted to use a dark field. So when I got the mask and realized it wasn't the right one, we ordered the mask again exactly the same way. We just flipped the from, from light to dark. And then they sent us the inverse of what, what we asked for the first time. OK, so dark means that it's all, all or mostly chrome, and there's some holes in it and gaps in it. And light field means it's mostly glass, and there's some chrome structures on it. And what you see is what you get. So if it's got a hole in the chrome, you're going to get a hole in whatever you're patterning. A hole in the resist, and then you expose the material under the resist. So wherever there's a hole in the resist, you get a hole in the material. OK. Then they have these other layers that are kind of crazy layers, right? You've got hole 0, hole 1, hole 2, hole M. Those aren't actual layers on their own. The whole zero is combined with the poly zero. So if I want to, I want to make a big structure in poly, okay, and then I want to put holes in it. I'll draw poly zero, and then I'll draw a bunch of holes that go into the poly zero using the whole zero layer in the design tools. The design tools takes the whole zero layer that you just drew and the poly zero layer you just drew and combines the two and puts one output file. This makes it easier for you to draw holes. If you don't do that, you're going to have to do something like this to make a hole in a plate. Can you imagine trying to draw this? It'll go nuts, right? Okay. See what I'm saying? rather than just make a plate and then go to hole zero and make holes. Done. OK, does that make sense? It's a convenience for the designer. Sandia started with this, right, way back in the 90s. And they were going nuts with it. Uh, Vicki Arbery, or one of his predecessors, said, hey, we can just make two masks, two layers, and combine them. And they used Boolean algebra for that. Right, or XOR, that kind of thing. Now, you don't want to draw a hole where there's no poly. Because what will happen is that hole will become a poly structure. Because it's interpreted differently. Right, when you do the XOR um, expression on it, you know, you don't have that other field, so it says, oh, well, you must want a structure here. All right. So here's another table. And these are all in your handouts, right? So you don't have to write all this down. But you have a bunch of different um, um, columns here. The ones that I want to point out are the, the one, three at the end. So there's nominal line space. So when you make a poly 0, you typically want to make it 3 microns or bigger. Then you have a minimum feature size. You can draw it as small as 2 microns. And they, they probably don't recommend that. They prefer you to do two or, or three or bigger. And then the last um, column is the minimum spacing. So you want your spaces to be two microns or bigger so they don't fuse. And you can see dimple is the same kind of thing, three microns, lines and spaces. Okay, You want to go much smaller than that, but you can if you have to. <coughs> And then minimum spacing is 3 microns in this case. And uh, mi minimum feature size is 2 microns.
size. Okay, so you don't want to put your dimples closer than three microns apart. So there's got to be a space between the dimple structures of three microns or more, and each dimple itself has to be at least two microns or more. Okay, and then the first three column headings are just different ways of labeling things. You know, the feature drawn is called a polyline. Um, there's a SIF level name and a GDS level name. The GDS has to do, I think, with the mass making. And the SIF layer has something to do with the process. So it's the labels they use internally at MEMSCAP when they're processing. I can probably, I probably should read up more on that. Um, the main thing, though, is to understand what these things are. So oxide hole, polyline, via hole, you know, uh, anchor hole, polyline, metal line, and then these four, one, two, three, four holes in the different um, poly and metal layers. Is this from the current version? I think it's from the Rev 13. Okay. That's what I was looking at. Because I think the minimum spacing now is four my four microns. Or like poly zero and poly. It could be it could be the overlay is it is four. So we'll look at that too in a little bit. If you're just making a space between two polys, I tried it, it and um, it doesn't like it. No. Okay. Well, you want to stick with nominal if you can, or bigger, right? Minimum is if you really have to make like a, a very fine spring for some reason, you know, you can try to make it two microns and it may or may not work. Okay, the whole layers, as I mentioned, there's four of them, are for the respective poly and metal layers. Okay, so that's so you can make holes in those layers or slots, right? Um, you might want to make slots in a, in a metal layer to make a grating. Okay, something like that. And this is in big bold print. Don't use the whole layers to define geometries other than the holes. <laughs> if you draw a hole by itself, if it's not on top of a um, poly, not enclosed by a poly layer, so a hole zero not enclosed by poly zero will end up being a, a poly structure, an island somewhere out by itself. Okay, and that can cause problems. It could lift off, and you have a little disc floating around, like a manhole cover, right? And that can do a lot of damage to other moving parts. Well, that was right. Sorry. That's okay. No, it's good. It's good, because sometimes the, the rules change over time. But I tried the structures in, in there, and it made, you know, the one that I had, like, four microns close, and the other one, it had a little lip. It was like a stringer overlay on the other one, even though it wasn't even that close. Okay. Well, we'll look at that as we as we come across it. That's that's good. We might have a. I might make an assignment where you purposely break the design rules and see what happens. Okay. So here they're, they're making mention that you can draw arcs and non-rectangular polygons. Try to stick with rectangular things. They usually work better. Uh, rectangular things, square things. I mean, if you draw a little, little square, it, it looks like a hole if it's small, right? Because the corners will round off. And when you actually process it, it'll look like a hole, even though you draw a square on your, on your design. So you can do non-rectangular things, okay? So you're welcome and, and encouraged to include non-Manhattan geometries. That's what that means, non-Manhattan geometries. So if you look at Manhattan from, the, from an airplane at 40,000 feet, you see a lot of squares, right? So those are Manhattan geometries, squares. Oh, Santa Fe geometry. Santa Fe geometry? The roads in Santa Fe make no sense. Oh, okay. Th those are the those are the the arcs and the and the non-rectangular polygons. That would be the Santa Fe geometries. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Keep in mind, however, that the masks are printed with a 0.25 micron spot size. So what does that mean? If I draw on my 
CAD program, on my MEMS Pro program, a line that's perfectly one micron wide, or let's say four microns wide, okay, it'll look like a four micron line um, on the software, and it'll probably look like a four micron width line on the mask. Now imagine if I take that line and I make it an angle. So how does it draw that? So the spot size, let me erase some of this. So when we make a mask, we usually use, use an electron beam, and we expose resist that's sitting on top of chrome. The electron beam has a certain size and shape. So that you're limited to that, right? So if you have a, a circular electron beam, you can move it straight in X, right? And you get a nice line. And of course, you know, if it's a 0.25 micron, you're going to draw several lines, right? To make that structure. And they'll overlap a little bit, right? So you get a nice straight line. So that, that's not so confusing. But what's really interesting is if you want to draw a line that's at an angle. Let's say I want to draw this kind of a structure. So when I make the mask, what, what does the electron beam do? It makes a dot, moves over, moves up, makes a dot, moves over, moves up, makes a dot, right? So it makes these dots, and if you blow it up, you're going to see something that kind of resembles a stair step on the edge, right? I'm not drawing it very well, but you get the idea. It's not going to be perfectly straight. Because when it draws it, it's got to move in X and Y. Okay, So it kind of stair steps. That's what they mean by masks are printed with a 0.25 micron spot size. So features, if you zoom in on them, on the mask will be rough. We'll have little stair steps on the edges, especially if they're rotated. So that's something to think about. So that's part of the slop, right? OK, and all features are limited by this registration. So we can only do that good as a quarter micron. OK, and registration refers to overlay, how accurate you can make something, how well you can place something in a field. So to minimize vertex snapping errors in the fracturing of the data, please use a 0.25 micron grid in the layout and avoid rotating cells. Wow, that's a mouthful. What does that mean? Vertex snapping. So when you rotate something, if I make a, make a cantilever, I can turn that into a cell. I can, I think, we have, April might know this, but we can copy the cell multiple times. So we can copy it, make a nice array of cantilevers. But then let's say we want to rotate some of the cantilevers 90 degrees. If you do that, you might run into some problems with vertex snapping. It may not be the same size vertically as horizontally, right? Because the computer has, has rotated it. So if you really want accurate um, orientation and sizing, you would probably want to make a horizontal cell and then a vertical cell version of it, and then copy those. And then you're, sh you're much more sure that it's going to look decent. And we want to use a, a quarter micron grid. We don't want to go smaller than that, because that will represent what the, what the mask making machine can do. Okay? You can, in CAD, you can go to a hundredth of a micron grid. But it doesn't buy you anything, and, it, and you'll be lying to yourself on the accuracy. All right. So that's also kind of called pixelation, right? We're limited to the pixel size of the printer, which in this case is the mask. So what does this mean? Um, spaces are drawn at 2 micron on non-orthogonal axes in poly 1 and 2 may not resolve. So even though the minimum feature size is 2 microns, if you draw a horizontal line or a vertical line, that'll probably print OK. If I make a diagonal line at 2 microns on my computer software, 
when we print it, it may not print because it may lose a quarter of a micron on each edge because of that pixelation, right? That snapping of the electron beam, you'll end up with one and a half micron it's trying to draw, and that's too small for the process to print. So that's why nominal, they say three microns, because if you make a diagonal line that's three microns, it will probably print. It might be two microns or two and a half microns, but it'll probably print, okay? So that's what those kind of phrases mean. In case of closely spaced poly features, this can lead to bridging. Bridging is a term used to describe when two things short out. Okay, it forms a bridge that's not supposed to be there. So that happens when you have small spaces. To minimize the possibility of bridging, it's recommended for non-orthogonal features, designers default to the nominal line space rules. So that's why the nominal line space rules were three microns, okay, while the minimum geometry was two. So if you're going to do something that's not horizontal or vertical, you really don't want to draw anything that's less than three microns. I saw this happen at Texas Instruments. We, uh, the designers drew some metal lines at the minimum size, right, vertically, and then they made a 45 degree angle. And they had like 15 of these bus lines, right? And when it made that angle, it looked pretty on the mask, you know? I think that's the designers always look, want to make it look nice, the layout. But when they did that, the electron beams snapped bigger on the lines. So the gap, the spaces got smaller, right? Because our pitch stays the same. Remember, we talked about that? So the lines got a little bigger, and the spaces got a little smaller, and our stepper couldn't resolve the small spaces. So we got bridging and shorts. And no one noticed it until, of course, the wafer got to the end of the line. We did electrical testing, and it failed miserably because everything was shorted out on those corners, and then we looked at it and we're like, what are these designers doing? So our mask finishing technicians went in and changed that part of the layout and fixed that mask layer. And then we were fine. And we sent an email to the designer saying, don't do that. Because they figured out it was a snapping issue. And it, it actually, the snapping issue wasn't in the making of the mask. The snapping was in the design program. The design program snapped to the wrong grid. Okay, so the designer should have caught that. All right, so you can see designers are really important to make sure that things are drawn properly so they work. Okay. So I hope you can see this. This is a little bleached out, but there's, there's four basic kind of... Um, overlay and envelope issues that are presented between the different layers. So this shows, you know, layer two, which is the red box, inside of layer one, which is the green box, and it has a letter A. So what that means is you got to have at least that much space between the edge of the green box, the outer edge of the green box, and the outer edge of the red box. Now the red box might be anchor one, and the green could be poly zero, okay? Or the red might be poly one, poly two via, okay? And the green could be poly one, right? So there are rules. Why do you think we have a rule for A? You know, what, what does that mean? We've got some slop, right? If we go up and down a little bit, we've got a little play there, right? So you have to remember the red box can move relative to the green box because of the alignment issues from one layer to another. So you get some movement there, right? You get some variation in the exact registration or overlay. Also, the A box can get bigger or smaller depending on variations in the process. So you've got that adding into it. And the green one, same thing. It could be moving up and down, or left and right, and it can be getting a slightly bigger, slightly smaller. So you need to build in those tolerances. Okay, and that's why we, we have design rules. So they know from experience, A's gotta be at least so much, and then you should be okay. 
because that, that's their process. That's how well their process can do. So does that make sense? You guys are good with that? Okay. Stop me anytime. Then there's another category. How close can a structure be to another structure? So one was how, how much does a structure have to be inside of a structure? And then another criteria is how close a structure can be to another structure. So we don't want to put layer one and two in this case closer to each other than B. OK? So that's a minimum space. We might get some unintended um, consequences if we break that rule. And we'll have examples of layers that have that sort of rule relative to each other. Now we may have this rule where we have to actually overlap one structure with another by at least this amount. Okay. So layer one has to overlap layer two by a certain amount. So they call that uh, minimum cut-in dimension. Okay, so there's a term for that. And then what do you think the last one is? It's how much it can overlap this way. So those are basically um, the overlapping type design rules. And, you, and you'll see they're different for different layers. OK, so I'm done with part one. OK, um, we'll go ahead and take a break. And then I'll pull up the design manual in a PDF format and show you how to interpret a couple of those things. And we're not going to go through all of them this time. And then relate that to the cantilever, OK? So we'll relate a few basic design rules to the cantilever, um, simple cantilever design we're going to do for your first assignment, OK? Questions? Is that clear? Yeah? Okay.